a third regime, I would say, Lucius-like approaches where the uh, calculations are more analytical. And here we can distinguish between retarded and non-retarded versions. And the retarded is actually, uh, basically when we can solve Maxwell's equations. And here I also include the QED approach, which is essentially a stress tensor calculation, but again relies on the exact calculation, uh, solving of the uh, boundary conditions uh, within the Maxwell's equation. And on the experimental side, I would say the progress has been a little bit slower because of all the complications and the lengthy experiments and expensive things that have to be um, in place in order to accurately measure the force. And um, you know, here there are some examples where progress has been made. And it all seems to be based on uh, all of these developments have to uh, seem to be stimulated by the progress that has been made in condensed matter systems. And a condensed matter material is essentially broadly defined. And here is some list of things that have stimulated these kind of, uh, this kind of progress. Chemical inert 2D layers, chemical inert 1D structures, Iraq materials, that's a new novel um, uh, area. But there's also 3D crystalline systems, such as um, materials that have voids, let's say metal organic frameworks, materials for hydrogen storage, lathrate materials, so voids that, are can, that can accommodate gas, gas atoms where vanilla interaction become important. But there's also composites and photonic crystals and optical, but there's also metal, uh, biomaterials. So all of these condensed matter systems have stimulated discoveries in new asymptotic propulsion. Um, uh, magnetic optical response properties, manifestation of Dirac physics, um, temperature effects, uh, other Casimir-like phenomena, new devices. So um, this, type of, this type of perspective we tried to, um, we didn't actually try, we did it, <laughs> presented in a paper that is going to appear in the Regis of Modern Physics, and I do hope that this paper will serve the community but it will also serve as a platform to open up the field and diversify the field to the condensed matter um, area, which is, I guess, again, the largest area in physics. So uh, we um, essentially can have new ideas to develop this field. Okay, so this kind of um, tour-like presentation, I'll begin by focusing on Casimir materials. And as we heard uh, in an earlier session, um, graphene is a 2D system, and in its low energy approximation, the energy band structure is very simple. It's a two band <coughs> linear model. It's a Dirac like system um, with a very simple expression for the energy. And this uh, band structure, low energy band structure, translates into a very simple expression for the optical conductivity. So being again from the condensed matter um, community, this is how I understand um, the, uh, the system. So this rather universal value that I have written here has been also uh, proven experimentally, has been shown experimentally to be the case, if we're looking at frequency regime below, let's say, 3 eV. So for the Casimir community, at the micrometer range, that seems to be case that I have to take into account when I describe the response properties for calculation of Cassini and loss force. So, by the way, this value translates into uh, the almost complete optical transparency of graphene, which also has been um, proven experimentally. But graphene offers other possibilities. Um, there are quasi-1D allotropes, such as graphene nanorubles. So imagine if I cut the graphene sheet along certain type of an edge, let's say an armchair edge or a zigzag edge, this two-band model becomes now multi-band. The gaps have been open, and simply from the requirement of um, the wave function being zero at the edges instead of being continuous, the energy band structure becomes edge dependent. But now imagine I roll this sheet, right? This ribbon, I roll it. And I make now a cylindrical quasi-1D structure, which is called a carbon nanotube. So carbon nanotubes can be single wall, multi wall <coughs> but again, now the situation changed. I'm creating a quasi-1D structure, but with periodic boundary conditions. So it's called a chirality-dependent energy band structure, which I have written here. 
So it's quite fascinating because depending on how I roll the sheet, I can create a metal or a semiconductor with about the same radius. So as you can see, graphene systems open up new possibilities to explore Casimir interaction. So in the next few graphs, I have summarized some of the most fascinating uh, consequences of that Dirac-like physics at 2D <coughs> for uh, Casimir and Van der Waals interactions. So if we're looking at an adult graphene sheet, basically the strictly two-band model uh, crossing at the Fermi level, we can uh, extract an asymptotic behavior of the Casimir force. Um, very interesting. It's essentially proportional to d to the 4, which is the same behavior as two perfect metals but the magnitude is quite reduced. And in fact, it can be written in this way. So if I substitute the expression for the universal conductivity, what I obtain is a, a, a force that actually has no quantum mechanics because there's no h-bar and there is no retardation, there's no c. If I compare the magnitude of the two forces, let's say for the force of perfect metals and the graphene, it appears that this is much, much, much reduced. And this we can translate to the almost optical transparency of the graphene. So, um, essentially, so if we're, if we're thinking in, in terms of Casimir physics, the thermal wavelength for typical metals and semiconductors is this. But now in graphene, the speed of light is substituted with the Fermi velocity. So, the thermal wavelength becomes dirac like thermal wavelength in 2D. And if I substitute the values, what I see is that the thermal wavelength becomes a lot smaller. What that means is that temperature effects, which for typical metals and semiconductors become apparent, let's say, at 7 micron for graphene, that happens a lot sooner. And in fact, if we're looking at temperatures at about 30 Kelvin and above, at 50 nanometers and above, we see the that the force is basically temperature based on classical temperature fluctuation. Quite fascinating. Of course, if we use real, real, realistic conductivity, and this we have done from an initial simulation, okay, so we include um, not the two, the, we go beyond the two-band uh, Dirac model, then we start to depart from this uh, asymptotic expression um, in, in, in this fashion. <laughs> So, but that's not all. It turns out that, as I said, the retardation is not important, but also spatial dependent, uh, spatial uh, dispersion seems to be unimportant in most cases. And we have checked for uh, cases such as if we now have a different chemical potential, we go beyond the uh, zero chemical potential approximation, but we also have a gap. So, in fact, if we introduce a gap into the Dirac model, and thus can happen with some impurities or, you know, substrates, whatever, um, we can quantify the onset of thermal effects near this quantity. And as you can see, now I have a tuning capability. I can enhance or inhibit the thermal fluctuations based on this product between the distance and this um, wave vector expression, essentially. So this is all due to the fact that essentially the speed of light is being replaced by the Fermi velocity. So the particles now, or rather the cosmic particles as we discussed this morning, in graphene, the exchange, um, electromagnetic exchange happens at a lot slower rate. Right? So these results have been, I think some of these um, results have been found um, computationally for the first time by John Dawson, but here we give them a more asymptotic expression with exact constants in the front. So, um, one of the uh, most fascinating consequences of this fact is that graphene cosmic interactions are strongly temperature dependent. And uh, Umar was giving a presentation earlier, and he was trying to determine when temperature effects can be important or not. And here we said, okay, why don't we propose a different scheme how we can observe this? And we borrow an idea that had been developed over the years. If we have uh, the electric layers with an ordered dielectric constant like so, we may be able to create a temperature-dependent equilibrium distance 
by you know, exploring the temperature dependent properties of the materials and cancellation of the attractive and repulsive force in the cosmic interaction. So if I take this idea and say, okay, let me construct a layered system with a, a fluid inside. And the, the electric properties of the materials follow that particular rule, and I suspend inside a graphene plate. So the energy balance due to the Cassinian temperature dependent Cassini interaction, the gravity and the buoyancy force. So if I do this, what I find is that there is a regime where the energy um, the, uh, of, of this energy balance essentially has this um, oscillator-like behavior. And the minimum of this oscillator, of this dip here, is essentially temperature dependent. So if I do some um, expansion, I can um, find what this minimum is, and I said this is temperature dependent mini, mini, uh, uh, position, and I can also uh, relate this to a harmonic oscillator and express frequency. So this equilibrium temperature dependent distance, I'm told, can be detected experimentally, and it varies as a 2-3 nanometers per Kelvin, around 300K, and I'm told that this is accessible experimentally via some microscope techniques and Nicholson interferometer and stuff like that. So perhaps that's one way, an additional way, to look at temperature effects in graphene systems. But now, you know, there are other systems beyond graphene. Class A1, the allotropes open up a new direction where we can explore Cassini and Donovan's interaction. So I asked myself, how can I calculate the interaction between Class A1 and the systems such as graphene nanoribus? And it turns out that if I want to solve the Maxwell's equation and pay, let's say, a Green's function for systems that have edges, that's not possible to do analytically. At least I couldn't do it. So I can do that computationally, but then again, finding analytical expression and synthetic expression becomes a lot more difficult. So we go to the next level, we say, okay, let's neglect regulation and we look at the density-to-density correlation approach and treat the Coulomb interaction essentially as a perturbation. So if I do this, um, we can, it turns out that I can write the interaction in a Lifshitz-like expression, as you can see. I can lump the contributions from the response properties of the two quasi the systems in something that appears like, I don't know, a reflection coefficient. So, but again, this is only if I treat the one, the quasi one the system as a wire. Okay, and I don't look at, that of course is valid if the distance um, separation between the two wires is larger than the radius or the width of the wire. So we go through the standard mechanism of an RPA wide summation of interaction, an RPA uh, calculation of the response properties. <laughs> and so this formalism you can apply not only to graphene algorithms, but to all 1D systems for which this approximation can be uh, imposed. Um, for graphene nanoribbons, as I said, um, there is a particular thing that I found quite fascinating. In fact, if, um, we, oops, sorry, if we start tuning the electronic structure with a chemical potential, I hit a regime where the intraband contributions to the response function become dominant. And what we find is that if that chemical potential is such that it's comparable to the width of the nanoribbon, then at one point, the temperature uh, uh, effects in the Vanuatu interaction dominate, and all the quantum mechanical effects are suppressed. That's quite opposite, quite unusual, I would say, not present in other systems. So how does that compare to other 1D systems? So we looked at uh, gallium arsenide wires, a types of uh, 1D system that had been studied in the 90s by the Salmon group, and they're telling us that the, uh, the uh, response function is at this time with a plasma frequency that's proportional to the STL state. But because this is a 1D system, the STL state are much reduced. As a result, the plasma frequency is reduced. And what that translates into is that in 1D systems, 
the interaction is thermal, at least for gallium arsenide one. <coughs> so, something that I haven't seen in, in any other 3D or 2D system. But, you know, beyond the graphene nanorubles, there's uh, nanotubes. Okay? So, for nanotubes, we have a different approach, okay? um, based on the chirality dependence of the response properties of the tubes. So for this problem, we're able to solve, um, the, uh, solve the problem via QED because the uh, Green's function can be found analytically for concentric uh, uh, symmetrical systems, but not for planar quantity system. So calculating the pressure, and we spend a lot of time in calculating actually the response functions of the uh, uh, nanotubes, what we find is something quite interesting. Again, the pressure is rather strongly dependent upon the chirality of the tube. <laughs> and uh, taking some uh, data for, let's say, experimentally observable chirality tubes, so these numbers, 18, 15, 27, 4, whatever, they specify the particular way the graphene sheet is rolled. And this particular way, this particular set of numbers is going to tell us what the response properties in the electronic structure of the materials is going to be. So, to the point, what we find is that there is one specific set of carbon nanotubes for which the pressure is the strongest. In other words, the interaction is the strongest. And that happens to be for metallic, what they call armchair, armchair nanotubes. And um, the reason for this is because this can be related to electronic energy loss spectrum. It turns out that for those tubes that have the strongest electronic energy loss spectrum that are overlapping, the Casimir pressure is the strongest. And in fact, um, subsequent experimental measurements have shown that actually armchair, armchair double wall carbon nanotubes have maybe four to one probability to be, uh, uh, to be made, to be synthesized, as opposed to any other choice. So what I'm saying is that perhaps that could be one uh, factor for which that preferential synthesis that happens in the lab may be contributing. <coughs> so another interesting thing that I mentioned earlier is that the Cassini interaction involving graphene systems is rather small, much reduced. So I'm asking a question. Why not look at other fluctuation-induced phenomena beyond the Cassini force and see what happens? Imagine if you have a wire and you measure the voltage between the two ends of the wire. What we see, uh, what you see, oh, my image here is not very good. What you see is that the fluctuations of the charges produces this due to the uh, uh, random movement of the electrons produces these fluctuations in the voltage. So imagine now. I connect the two wires, one end on the graphene flag and another end that's on a metallic substrate. What happens to these charges? Well, they get transferred to the graphene sheet, but also to the metallic sheet. What did I create? Well, I created a capacitor, right? So this is a nanocapacitor. In the lab, people make it, this wire is essentially replaced by a contact, but the constant applies. So I say, okay, these fluctuating charges, just like the fluctuating dipole, um, can be related to an energy. So if I apply fluctuation dissipation theory to the fluctuation charges, I create a fluctuation force, but now due to the real fluctuating charges rather than virtual dipoles. So quite different. So the key quantity here is the capacitance. Well, what's capacitance? The capacitance is contains several contributions. The first one is the so-called geometrical capacitance, the fact that, you know, typical electrostatic capacitance that we learn in, in, in general physics books and such. But because this is a nanostructure system, it's sometimes called quantum capacitance. And the quantum capacitance is due to the fact that essentially, since that is a layered system, the charges cannot be completely screened. This quantum capacitance can be related essentially to the chemical, to, to the difference between the types of charges at the Fermi level. 
But since I'm talking about a quant a capacitor, then there is a charging mechanism for which the, these charges, fluctuating charges, get transferred to the two substrates, which is the graphene <coughs> and the metallic substrate. So I'm allowing for this charging mechanism to happen in some kind of a circuit-like system, and that's or actually a doodad-like circuit. <coughs> so going back to my uh, 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 formalism, I can calculate this monopolar fluctuation force now due to real charges. Looking at the quantum capacitance, what we see is that the quantum capacitance has these peak-like structures for now ribbons, okay, for which the width is smaller. But if I have a wider flake, then these quantum, uh, these, these peaks sort of get averaged out from the temperature. Um, then I, I can compare. I could say, okay, how does this, is it possible to have a regime where this new type of fluctuation force can be comparable or, even, or can it even overtake the Cassini interaction? And the answer is yes, it's possible. And in fact, what we see is that uh, because, again, due to the fact that the Cassini interaction involving graphene systems, it's much reduced, I may be able to create a regime by varying the properties of the wire now, how I can enhance this type of fluctuation force. And it turns out that for this uh, monopolar fluctuation for thermal, uh, thermal effects may be quite more important as opposed to, let's say, typical Cassini interaction. So the message for this, uh, for, from this piece of work is that the field of fluctuations are going to go beyond Cassini. And let's say in solid state physics, we have capacitors, which may be um, uh, giving an opportunity to look at other phenomena. But the materials library is, is expanding. There is life beyond graphene. There is things that people now say or make in the lab, such as silicine or germane or stannin, essentially looking at the uh, periodic table beyond, uh, below the carbon. And the Hamiltonian for such systems is a little different. Simply because of the spirit like lattice that looks like graphene from the top, we have a spinotic coupling. And if I apply an electric field perpendicular to the, uh, to the surface, I can tune the electronic structure. So we took this Hamiltonian and we calculated the Kuba formalism, the response properties of graphene, stunning uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, stunning, uh, the other systems that I have to show. And what we see is something quite interesting. It appears that this damping parameter that seems to be unimportant in graphene makes a big difference into the Cassini energy for silicy, for example. And as you can see, if you do or do not include, not all, everything changes. The characteristic dependence in terms of distance, but also magnitude. And now, imagine now I start tuning the electric field. I can open the cones, I can open two, I can open them all. And again, looking at the uh, influence of that damping parameter, the characteristic behavior of the energy changes. So perhaps instead of spending eight years <laughs> in tweaking your experiment to make sure that you know, we catch that um, separation between glute versus plasma, that opens up a different opportunity to explore a other 2D surface system for which now the whole characteristic behavior changes. But since I'm from the kinesthetic community, as I said, I'm also a practical person. How can I make the van der Waals or the Casimir force, which is said, work for me? I can create new types of allotropes, such as folds, right? Where now the van der Waals force from the attraction between the parallel layers can work in my favor and create something that's called a partial carbon tube. So electronic structure calculations that we did uh, with details that, let's say, you can find in some, some papers, um, relate proper, uh, particular uh, values and uh, features in the electronic structure can be captured if you include vulnerable interruption. But you know, people are talking, people are talking about now 
heterostructures. So imagine now that I make this Lego-like systems by putting one layer of graphene, one layer of silicine, one layer of molybdenum sulfide. Two D systems, but made of calcagenite atoms. So if I do this, the question becomes: Is it useful from the you know from condensed matter, let's say optics uh, uh, applications? The first thing that we look at is at the electronic structure. But the second thing that we say, okay, how does the Van der Waals interaction play a role here? So not only do I have to have a accurate way of, of describing it, but there's a new problem that occurs because I have to create these, these heterostructures and creating something that's called a supercell. So instead of using the unit cell of graphene, which is two atoms, for example, because of the incommensurate lattice, I have to make, I have to use, let's say, five from graphene and three from silicine. What does that mean? Well, that means that my ruin zone is mixed up. So I have to do unfolding of the bands. So the need to study this 2D heterostructure now created a new problem, computational problem. How do I unfold band structure? And here's a result I'm showing. But there are devices, right? So why don't I use, again, the Van der Waals interaction to help me create a new device? And here we use the concept that had been um, demonstrated in the lab. Um, if I have a double wall nanotube with finite dimensions and we extrude the inner tube, the Van der Waals interactions from the edges make the tube oscillate. So this is the fastest mechanical oscillator available in the lab on the gigahertz scale. So if I put a surface at the end, and the ridges and the valleys of the surface are going to influence that oscillator thing, uh, frequency. If I put a detector on the end, measuring the changes in these oscillator, in, in, in the oscillations, I can essentially map the surface. What do I do? I will solve two engineering problems. One is I increase the resolution by one order so I can see the surface much better. And the other one, I'm told that in the FM tips, the biggest part, one of the biggest problems is how close to the surface can you get. Well, this vulnerable interaction between the end of the tube and the surface guarantees that I'm always going to be at three to four angstroms. So I solve that problem. So with this, I end my talk. And I hope I gave you a good idea of the range of problems that are open to the Desperate community. Um, and perhaps we can solve existing problems, but also create new ones and expand the field. So with this, I also want to acknowledge um, people that I have worked on that uh, review paper, but also benefited from uh, discussions along the, uh, over the years. To Thank you. We have time for one short question. Uh, I have a question about this uh, monopolar fluctuation force. Uh, it, would it be present too for two uh, gold surfaces put yes, into contact? Yes, like in the, the experiments? Right, but the calcium force would be much stronger. I will overtake it. Right. Uh, you have, so I couldn't maybe. find a regime. I could not find a regime for which that is going to be present in the system. Yeah, that's true. And as a 50 nanometers, uh, 
I show three kilos. And for two kinds of separation, how, by how, determine the Casimir effect. So, and this is 50 50 percent. So, at 50 nanometers, the temperature is smaller. So, the, the, the electric properties don't have much of a dependence on the temperature. Polarization sensor depends on the temperature. Okay. And temperature dependence of polarization sensor gives a one half of thermal effect and 50 nanometers. It's one, uh, another one half. Full of the, the so, this is, this is just from the mass bars, actually. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you.